Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Wednesday, February 24th. And the first thing we're going to do this morning is we are looking at a um, part of a committee bill from the Committee on Corrections and Institutions. And uh, it's regarding the sexual exploitation of an inmate. And uh, we have attorney Bryn Hare here who will uh, walk you through this section. And also, um, if you're able to give us a little bit of background as to how, uh, how this section came about, uh, the work of the uh, commissioner, DOC commissioner, his leadership on this issue, as well as uh, a, um, a report that um, has been um, filed and um, regarding um, you know, sexual exploitation and issues that have been going on in our correctional facilities. So with that, I, good morning and welcome Bryn, thank you. Good morning committee, um, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council um, and thank you for that introduction. So I will give the committee a little bit of background um, about where this language came from. You'll note that the bill um, is a committee bill. It was put together early in the session um, uh, at the request of the Department of Corrections. And much of it stems from a report um, that was um, delivered to the Agency of Human Services on December 23rd of, this, of last year. And some of you may remember that the Agency of Human Services engaged down Sir Ackland Martin to conduct an independent investigation into um, kind of some, some of the things that were going on at the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility, which is the state's women's facility, um, in particular with respect to the prevalence of sexual abuse, sexual harassment, sexual misconduct, and sexual exploitation. So um, the report detailed several areas for the department to work on, and the department came forward to the Corrections and Institutions Committee with some requests uh, that would help operationalize some changes within the department um, to meet some of the recommendations that were made in the report by Downs Racklin Martin. So one of those recommendations um, is what we're gonna look at this morning as a part of that committee bill. Um, and it's section eight in the House Corrections and Institutions Bill. It sounds like you all have that bill before you so that I don't need to share my screen. Is that right? Okay. Yes, that's that's correct. It's, again, it's just section eight. Um, yep. Section so eight, which starts at the bottom of page eight. Um, and it has a little reader subheading that should be helpful that says crime. And the um, statute is 13 VSA 3257. So what the um, DRM report noted is that this, so the state does have an existing sexual exploitation statute um, that prohibits certain types of conduct um, between employees of the department um, or contractors or other people who are providing services to the department and people who are being supervised um, by the department. But the report noted that the prohibition is really, the existing prohibition is really too narrow. And I'm going to, um, if you look down at the top of page nine, um, you can see the, what, um, how, how this prohibition is a bit narrow um, because it, it provides that only when a person is being supervised um, by the department where that employee or contractor or person providing services for the department has that inmate or other supervisee um, assigned to them as a part of their caseload. So that's um, that is the only, those are the uh, circumstances under which uh, this kind of conduct is prohibited. So the recommendation of DRM was to broaden it so that the prohibition would apply to any supervisee relationship um, with uh, a department employee or contractor or person who's providing services for the department. So it's prohibited across the board as opposed to only prohibited if there um, is a direct supervisee supervisor relationship between the two individuals. So the language here, um, you can see that the change is just to strike that language that qualifies um, when the conduct is prohibited where the employee contractor or other service provider is currently engaged in a direct supervisory relationship with the person being supervised. So we strike out that language. So then um, the criminal prohibition would apply to um, 
any relationship between a person who's confined to a correctional facility or being supervised by the department and a person who's employed by the department or otherwise providing services for the department. So it's pretty straightforward. Thank you, there. and again, this language came from, uh, from the Department of Corrections, right? The request came from the department, yes, yes. Um, as, a, as a direct um, part of the report from Downs Rockland Martin. Right, right, and um, do, you, do you know why, why it was drafted this way when we did it? So I believe that um, there was a concern raised um, in this, on the Senate side when this was originally being worked on that it may prohibit existing relationships um, between supervisees and supervisors. So for example, if a person was incarcerated and their spouse was um, working for the department, that it may criminalize um, that relationship. That's my understanding of the history. I, I didn't work on this originally, but that is um, my understanding of why we originally put this um, qualification in statute. Right, and that matches my, my memory as well. And so one might ask, well, is that still a concern? Um, you know, I guess we would talk to the prosecutors in terms of how, how often those, those cases might, you know, is that what's really going on? Is that what, you know, what we're really looking for? Uh, so, okay, uh, Tom and then Ken, I'm sorry if I'm mixing up the order, but. Both Thank you. Here. Yeah. Marina, I, I think I know the answer to this, but so supervisees uh, and supervisors, um, this this doesn't apply to a relationship that say uh, two correctional officers may get into because th that that could be the same same uh, uh, situation I guess as far as being a, a supervisor or super supervisee. No, so the statute only applies when one person is being supervised by the department. So I think the idea behind the sexual exploitation uh, statute is really when there's a power differential between two yep. individuals, um, like <laughs> abusing a position of vulnerability, differential power or trust for sexual purposes. So it does, it would not, the statute would not apply um, if it's a relationship between two employees of the department. Great, that's, that's what I thought, but I just wanted clarification, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken. Just help me out, please, Bryn. The, the commented RW6 on the right-hand side, what's that mean? Um, so this, let's see. The, so this draft was really um, put together quickly and there were many questions that, that still needed to be answered by the committee. So there are some notes um, on the side from legal staff that are sort of directing the committee um, where they need to make decisions. But I would just point out that that is, um, applies to section seven, which you're not, which you don't have to deal with. So what's RW6 mean? That's just who did it? That's yep. the initials? Yep. Who made the comment? Okay, Thank thanks. And um, okay, that's it for now, thanks. Sure. Okay. And um, so do we have anything like this somewhere else, sexual exploitation, no other, you know, similar law in terms of this, you know, power imbalance, um, supervisory relationships? Um, that's a good question. And my colleague, Michelle Childs, often works on the sexual crime, so I wish she were here to answer that. Um, but I believe, but I believe we do, yes. Um, okay, and I'm sorry, I don't- Sexual exploitation of a minor okay. um, is also prohibited. Um, right, right. If the actor is in a position of power, supervision over the minor by virtue of their uh, professional status or voluntary status. So for example, a volunteer or a camp counselor or something like that. Um, also, we have a statute prohibiting sex, sexual exploitation of a person in the custody of law enforcement. So that's a similar. Thank you. Um, right. And 
do those talk about, are those as narrow as this? And again, um, I'm putting on the spot. Right, so um, I, not quite as narrow. So the, the sexual exploitation um, of a person in the custody of law enforcement prohibits a law enforcement officer from engaging in any sexual act with a, with a person that the officer is detaining, arresting, or otherwise holding in custody, or who the officer knows is being detained, arrested, or held in custody. So there doesn't have to be that direct relationship in the law enforcement statute. Um, and... And that's the most recent one we did, I think. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, and no, there doesn't have to be a direct relationship in the sexual exploitation of a minor statute either. It just provides that no person shall engage in a sexual act with a minor if the actor is at least 48 months older than the minor and the actor is in a position of power, authority, or supervision over the minor by virtue of their um, status, professional status. Um, so there doesn't, it, there, it's not, the language isn't quite as narrow in that statute either. Okay, great. That's helpful. And also I just want to note we are not doing anything to the fine or it's not proposed to be anything, anything done to the fine that's remaining the same. Right. As well. Um, the fine or imprisonment. Um, okay. Barbara and then um, Tom and can I see your hands are up. I'm not sure if it's from before. New questions, certainly. You're welcome to. My, mine's up again. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, Barbara and then uh, Tom and Ken. Yeah. Um, so, Bryn, I think there's also a statute if somebody is um, in the care of um, the Department of Mental Health. But you, you're, you're probably right about that. I, I, don't, I don't know them all. Okay. Um, off the top and of I was thinking right I was my when um chair grad was just suggesting about comparable I was going to try to find that one because um it seems like it's as similar you know more than the child one but um okay thank you yeah I think that that's right there are we have several prohibitions on sexual abuse um also which I believe is that one the department of mental health Great, thank you. Uh, Tom and then Ken. Thank you. It's scary, Maxine. We're starting to think alike a little bit because I was gonna ask basically the same question that you just did, but which also brought up another question for me. So with the, the crime, uh, are, the, are the crime slash penalty the same, say between a corrections uh, situation and an arresting officer situation? Is, is it the same crime? The same penalty? Yeah, same, yeah, same crime, penalty. Yes. Okay. Same penalty. Yeah, thank you. No, I guess uh, I'm going to assume it's probably, and I know I'm putting you on the spot because it's not your, it's not your thing here, but with a situation with a, say, a camp counselor and somebody younger, that's, that's a, probably a different crime and penalty, isn't it, if, if it's a, a minor? Um. That is a different penalty, yes. Um, but there is a there is an kind of um, aggravated um, provision in the sexual exploitation of a minor statute that provides for an enhanced penalty, which is the same. So there's um, the original violation is one year or a two thousand dollar fine or both, and then if a person um, the, the enhanced penalty is. Uh, five years or ten thousand dollars if the person um, abuses their position of power authority or supervision in order to engage in a sexual act so, so um, there's kind of a baseline and then an, and then an aggravated penalty great thank you Ken so uh, just to make sure the Department of Corrections is asking for this change the Department of Corrections is asking for the change is that what you said Yes. Okay. Yes, they yes, they are. And and just one more time, the reason um did we start in section seven? Is that where we started on this where the the change in stations? No. Or just the, section eight. Right. It's just section eight. So the, the bill 
bill, um, the full bill addresses many recommendations that were issued by Downs or Eklund Martin in their report. Um, as, as I mentioned at the outset, the report really dealt with the um, allegations of sexual exploitation at the women's facility. So there's the bill addresses a bunch of different recommendations that were made by the report. But the only one you're looking at is the is the crime for now. Thank you. And Bryn, um, did the um, Corrections and Institutions Committee, did they take testimony on this specific section? Um, they, yes, they did. I haven't been there all for every um, hearing about the bill because I've been in other places, but they did take testimony from the department, I believe. And um, I'm not sure if they've taken testimony from anyone else on, the, on that particular provision. I think that they wanted to send it to the Judiciary Committee before taking a bunch of um, testimony on it. Okay, Th thank you. Uh, Barbara. So Bryn, I um, could not get to the bill earlier. So um, I'm looking at the wording that you were talking about earlier and have a question which, um, I'm sorry, again, you may have covered, but I was looking for the bill. Um, so in, in the part that, uh, part page nine, the subsection two, I'm understanding that it's because um, we're trying to eliminate just one narrow situation, right? Of if that person is supervised by, like maybe the abuse is happening among two colleagues um, and there's not a supervisory relationship and we're trying to make it broader? I Essentially, yes, but um... I think that what it's really trying to do is to say there's a power differential um, regardless of whether the supervisee is in a direct supervisor supervisee relationship with the with um, the staff person. Right. So it it applies regardless of whether or not there, that's like a direct caseload. The person is is in the DOC employee's caseload or not, which is great. I'm I'm happy to see that. The part that I'm now wondering about is up above where it says um, uh, uh, a person who is providing, I'm trying to remember the word they use, not treatment, but um, direct services maybe. Uh, and I'm trying to remember where I saw that, but it, it was, uh, it's actually a part that isn't, change so it's in a i guess no correctional employee contractor or other person providing services so i'm wondering and i'm thinking about the case in upper upstate new york where maybe my facts are wrong but what if it's somebody who is in a clerical position i mean so it i'm, I'm wondering why we're limiting it limiting it to people who are providing services to offenders as opposed to people that work in the correctional facility. Because in some ways, somebody who is um, in an auxiliary position is still in a power um, position. And I don't think it does limit it. I think, okay. that, I think because it says no correctional employee contractor, I think those, those words are not qualified by the providing services. Providing services only apply only qualifies or other person. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, somebody in the waiting room. Oh, okay, great. Coming in. All right. Wonderful. So let's now switch to H145. And there is posted a uh, new language. Let's um, give everybody a minute to, to get there. I believe it's under Bryn's name again. Uh, there's, I think there's two copies posted under Bryn's name is, I'll just open them and answer for myself. I was wondering if one is Oh, one is highlighting and one doesn't. Brent, in terms of a walkthrough, is there 
Do you have a preference as to which one we? Yeah, I'm just looking at the website too. Um, it there should be. Yep, it's uh, it actually says draft H145 draft 1.1 1 .1 to 2021. But it, once you open it, it actually is draft 1.2. And that's the. Sorry, I that's, just read something. Apologize. All good. Okay. Okay, great. Tom, you, uh, your hand up. Tom, did you have a, oh, okay, guess not. No, I lowered it. Okay, great. Okay, committee members, do you have the uh, draft 1.2 of H145? Yep, all good? Okay, great, great. Britton, thank you. I'll let you okay, yeah. so um, draft 1.2, 3.54 p.m. on the 22nd, um, I'll just start right in um, with the changes and which all appear in yellow. Um, and the first one is the definition. We've got a reorganized definition section because um, the first change the draft makes is to change prohibited restraint to chokehold. So now it appears first in the definition section under standards for law enforcement use of force. And you'll see that this definition looks different from prohibited restraint as it appeared um, in the as introduced version. And um, what, what this definition does is it, it mimics the Massachusetts um, police reform bill definition of chokehold, um, except that it does not include that, um, the provision in the Massachusetts version, which requires that um, the chokehold result in serious bodily injury or death or be intended to result in serious bodily injury or death. So it's a little bit, um, broader of a definition than Massachusetts for that reason. Um, but you did hear some testimony that um, from, from some of the witnesses that this definition was preferred. Um, so we've put, dropped this in here to replace prohibited restraint. And you will see that um, the bill has grown quite a bit. And that's because we replaced that definition throughout um, the titles where it appears. And so much of the bill will just be um, that change. So the next change is on page two. Um, that subdivision five is highlighted just as in, that's just an error. There's no change to the definition of law enforcement officer. Um, but totality of the circumstances should be highlighted. Um, and that is the definition that you saw the last time you took up H145. The, I believe it was proposed by Representative Lalonde. Um, that's the language that. Uh, is a little bit different from, from the version of um, S-119 that passed last year. So it means conduct and decisions of law enforcement leading up to the use of force and all facts known to law enforcement officer at the time, including the conduct of the person or persons involved. So you'll notice that this removes the, um, the bystanders language. I do see a question, so should yeah, I? Yeah, sorry, Barbara, yeah. Okay, I put my hand down, but didn't push mute before. So, um, so it also removes or should have known. So that did. So you did have or should have known in a previous iteration during your work right. on S one nineteen, um, but that is not the should have known was not in um, one nineteen as it passed. Okay, I guess I didn't realize that, um, <clears throat> and. The bystander part was taken out because it was confusing of who was a bystander. So I believe you did hear from witnesses. Um, so for, you heard from quite a few witnesses on, on this issue. There was some dis dispute about who would be a bystander and also some concerns that um, a bystander's conduct would not, should not, would not, should not um, impact an officer's decision to use force. And I remember asking, because <clears throat> my original um, thought was that it was police officers or other law enforcement that come on the scene and was told, well, then they're not a bystander. But we have seen situations where law enforcement has been a bystander and not called 911 or tried to get the person's knee off somebody's neck. 
Um, this would cover any law enforcement officer on the scene, the way it's written? The, the, so I see another hand. I don't know if Berkeley well, yeah, wants jump to in, respond to that. Yeah, can I jump in for just one sure. second on, the, on this, on, on the totality of circumstances? Um, all that about the bystander would be subsumed in all facts known to the law enforcement officer. Uh, the, the big change on the totality of circumstances is making clear that we're talking about the conduct and decisions of the law enforcement officer leading up to the use of force. That's kind of a separate component of this, which is different than, than that. That's really one of the major advances, I think, of this, of this law is actually that. And then the second part is pretty standard, and that's all facts known to the law enforcement officer, which would include what the bystanders are doing actually could also include the conduct of the person or persons involved. That would be subsumed in that. The reason why we have that phrase in there is, is because we wanted, just because we're saying the conduct of the law enforcement officer, we wanted to also make very clear that we're talking the conduct of the subject you know, as well. But all that other stuff is caught in the, the facts known to the officer, including whatever bystanders are there, whatever was the relevant fact for why the force was used, uh, that, that would be subsumed in that. Okay, so if force is being used and um, let's say it was questionable how much force was needed and another law enforcement officer was there and did nothing, would they, what would, how would this bill hold that person accountable? So that, that is already, there's a couple places. There's in the use of lethal force if somebody sees a chokehold being used. But if uh, you recall in S219 that we passed, uh, we put into the disciplinary proceedings and such uh, intervention if there is a excessive use of force. So if, uh, if by, you know, that, that a law enforcement officer is supposed to intervene. So, so that is covered, but just not, okay. not necessarily directly in this bill. Am I, am I remembering that right, Bryn? You are, and it does now appear in the bill um, in section four because we're amending the definition of prohibited restraint throughout, but it is in title 20 in the um, misconduct section, um, a requirement that, law that a law enforcement officer intervene if they witness another law enforcement officer using excessive force. It's or just call not, Pardon? Or call 911 or something. They have to, they're required to either intervene or report to a supervisor. Okay. And can I follow up and ask Martin a question, Maxine, or should I wait? Okay. So Martin, if a law enforcement officer didn't read the vlog that day or something and was somehow negligent in knowing facts that were known to law, to law enforcement, but not to that officer. How is that, the way it's worded now, I sort of feel like you could put your blinders on and not know a whole lot. Um, I'm gonna let Bryn take the first shot at that because we okay. have she and I have talked about that, but. Okay, thanks. So if I, if I, um, Representative Rachel Sun, if I, do I understand your question correctly that you're asking if there, if the standards impose any duty on um, another law enforcement officer to, um, I see you shaking no. your hand. Yeah, so, so basically what, how it's changed of, um, all the facts known in the law to the law enforcement officer. So I'm saying if that law enforcement officer decided not to read the log that day that went out that said uh, a person with Alzheimer's is on the loose and we're trying to find him and didn't know that because they, they didn't follow through on information that is available, but not to that officer. So um, I think that where you need to look is section subsection B4, and that is okay. the analysis that um, the court will do in a, in, in a case um, that evaluates whether or not the officer's um, use of force was reasonable. 
And it is based on the totality of the circumstances, but it is the, it's the reasonable officer standard. So it's going to be that, that officer's um, actions are going to be judged um, on that reasonableness standard. So would a reasonable officer have, have behaved the same way in these circumstances? I understand what you're asking though, is that because totality of the circumstances only includes the facts known to the officer, um, would that impact uh, the outcome? And uh, I, I mean, I think that's a legitimate question. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Bryn, thank you. I don't see any other hands. Okay. I think maybe there is. Sorry, <laughs> Ken. So, trying to ask this question eloquently. When cops are called out to deal with a situation, it's not like they have a whole booklet that they have time to go and read or even a sheet of paper or anything like this to go and try to save the person that might be in trouble, whether it's mentally or whatever. They're just going and trying to assess the best possible job at that time to make sure nothing worse happens to that individual or anybody else around, correct? Is it that the job of law enforcement? So I, I'm not sure that's a question for, for Bryn <laughs> um, in terms of the language. Right now we're looking at, at, at the language of, of this proposed amendment. Um, that's, that's, I very much appreciate your question. We do have um, quite a few witnesses from law enforcement testifying. Um, who I'm sure will answer, be able to answer your question. And, uh, okay, thank you. Sure, uh, Tom. Thank you. No, I just, uh, what, what Barbara was saying, I, I just wondering if she's referring to something that happened in Vermont or, or out of Vermont, as far as the knee on the neck thing. Not in Vermont. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, so I'll, I'm going to keep going then. <clears throat> if you if you turn if you scroll to page three, you'll see there's some um, language that has been struck through, um, and I just want to point out to the committee that this, without the benefit of hindsight, was language that um, H145, as introduced, included, but it was not a part of um, S119 as it passed last year. So this was a proposal to include, and we've and we've struck it out here. Um, so you would remove that qualification without the benefit of hindsight. So I'll get to you in a second. And again, committee, I, um, this is a proposed amendment. Um, just want to, you know, make that clear that we're putting this out here for discussion. Uh, still looking at the bill as as introduced because we have not taken any any votes on this yet. Uh, Tom. No, I've got to learn to put my hand down. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. Uh, okay. Oh, Martin, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, uh, on that particular change, um, I mean, would you, would you agree, Bren? I, I think that we, you know that we've heard from a number of witnesses as far as whether that's a redundancy, whether that really is is captured. Uh, in the language on based on the totality of the circumstances or, or not. I'm wondering if you can you know, let us know from your perspective. Yep. Um, so it was when you were working on S-119 last year, um, the, the committee gave a lot of thought to this provision about whether or not um, you should include that language. Because as you probably remember, it comes, that comes pretty closely from uh, federal court jurisprudence on um, these types of claims. But um, it was, you made the decision last year not to include it because it, um, of your work on the totality of the circumstances definition. So I would agree that including it here is unnecessary given that the totality of the circumstances includes um, that language about all facts known to the officer at the time. And um, I believe you heard some testimony that it, including that, uh, qualification here as well 
um, may signal to the courts that you want to further limit their inquiry. Um, um, and I would agree with the fact that the courts will read, will interpret every word that's included in these standards. So if you um, limit the, if you put that limit on the totality of the circumstances and then you limit it again in the analysis section, I do think courts will give that meaning um, and, it, and they may further limit their inquiry based on including it in two places. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Bryn, thanks. Okay, so the next uh, change is on page five. Um, you've at- I'm sorry, I apologize. Be before you go ahead, there was a, a change that was proposed that we have not made in this. I mean, it, it's, it's not in the amendment, it was not in the introduced, but it was something certainly we've talked about. And, and that was the adding the, to the extent feasible at the beginning of B5. Right. And yep. If you could just uh, explain from your perspective that language. Sure, sure. So uh, B5 um, for everybody is on page three. And just as a reminder to the committee, this is that um, language that directs law enforcement um, that know that a subject's conduct is the result of some um, type of impairment or disability or other, or other uh, factor sort of outside of the subject's control, that the officer take that information into account when determining whether or not to use force and the amount of force that um, is, is necessary. So this is another um, part of the standards that the committee really, you took a long, you took a long time working on this language. Um, and the focus was really whether um, an officer with this information who knew, who had this knowledge should use it or should or not? Should it um, should that knowledge be a factor in their decision about use of force? And um, if so, I think that some of the testimony about adding if feasible to this um, particular provision may have misunderstood the purpose of this provision, which is it's not this is not where the assessment is made. This is not about um, law enforcement making an assessment of a person. The directive is pretty straightforward that if the officer knows, has knowledge of an impairment, then they have to um, use that knowledge in their, in their decision-making about the use of force. So, um, so in B4, directly above it, this is the provision that talks about what is feasible or not. And again, B4, if you remember, this is kind of the, um, this is a little bit of the beating heart of this use of force section because this is where the court, this is what directs the court um, in their analysis of, of law enforcement use of force. So force has to be objectively reasonable and their failure to use feasible and reasonable alternatives um, to force will factor into whether that use of force was objectively reasonable. So um, this is where you have the feasible qualification is in B4. And um, I can't, you know, B4 is a very important provision because it talks about that reasonableness analysis. Um, B5 is a simple sort of straightforward directive. If the officer has the knowledge, then they have to use it. Um, but that is qualified by B4 because B4 requires that, that um, it be feasible for an officer to use the information. Is that, <clears throat> does that get at what, um, at your question, Representative. Thank you. Thank you. Committee members, is, is that clear? Because that's that's an important uh, point. So we make sure folks understand that. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, Bryn, thanks. Okay, so the next uh, change- Madam Chair, before we go on, Bryn, can, can you just go through an explanation on number four again? Just to make sure I've- uh, I, under, I do understand it. Sure, so B4 you mean? Yes. So B4, this, is, um, this provides some context for what, a reasonable, what reasonableness means under these circumstances. And it says that um, decision by law enforcement has to, um, whether the decision of a law enforcement officer to use force is objectively reasonable is evaluated from the perspective of a reasonable officer in the same situation. Um, based on those totality of the circumstances, which we went through before. And um, 
that analysis is going to turn on whether um, there were any other feasible alternatives to the use of force. So that is where you have the feasible qualification. Failure to use feasible and reasonable alternatives are a consideration for whether the law enforcement's conduct was objectively reasonable. Okay, <clears throat> we probably discussed it a hundred times, but where does the perspective of a reasonable officer come from? Do you mean in the in the court's analysis? Uh, well, no, in number four here, uh, shall be evaluated from the perspective of, of a reasonable officer in the same situation. Who, uh, who or where does the uh, perspective come from? A, so, a colleague or? Uh... So, so courts use this sort of reasonable person standard um, quite regularly in their decision making about, um, about tort cases that come before them. So uh, the reasonable officer standard is 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 quite well understood by by um, by the courts, and they and they do use different markers to determine what is reasonable conduct. Um, but am I am I getting to what you're asking, or are you asking about whether or not there are um, particular witnesses that would testify as to? What yeah, well, yeah. Well, what you what you touched on certainly, uh, I, I think, is part of it, but. Um, is there witnesses and that type of thing also in these situations? So my understanding is that there does not need to be expert witness testimony um, about what constitutes reasonable officer conduct, but rather that it's a, a the inquiry is what would a reasonable officer do in that situation with an understanding that officers receive certain types of training and have certain experience. Um, but I don't I don't think expert testimony is is a part of that reasonable inquiry. Right, uh, uh, and I'm I'm a little surprised, but because as time goes on, um, reasonable certainly changes. Um, in, in 1920, um, reasonable was probably a bit more brutal than it is today. Um, right, and so, so is that all in the training that you mentioned? So yeah, so courts will often look to um, the law enforcement's um policies in determining whether or not their um their actions were reasonable um i think quite a few of the the cases that you looked at when you were when you were working on 119 specifically pointed to the um, law enforcement's policies and training um to confirm whether or not their their actions were or conduct was re was reasonable great thanks for the refresher <laughs> okay thanks brain Okay, um, so I'm going to move down to page five. This is a new, you've added a new subdivision to subsection C, which um, you remember is the, is the standards for use of deadly force. So you've added a subdivision six, which provides that law enforcement shall not use a chokehold on a person unless lethal force is justified pursuant to subdivision one of subsection C. And subdivision one, if you scroll up to the previous page, you remember this is that standard for when um, law enforcement are justified in using deadly force. And that is um, only when, based on the totality of the circumstances, such force is objectively necessary, reasonable and necessary to defend against an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury to the officer or another person or to apprehend a fleeing person if the officer reasonably believes that that person will cause death or bodily injury to another, serious bodily injury to another person. So only um, under those circumstances may a law enforcement officer use a chokehold. Martin. Yeah, I, I, is it appropriate at this time just for me to give a, a, a quick rationale for why I suggest, uh, you know, suggest this in this proposed amendment. Sure. Um, so I think, I mean, I think overall what we've done in this amendment is make much, uh, make it much clearer as far as uh, how to address or, or treat chokeholds. You know, we, we have the definition now where it describes what a chokehold is. The previous definition was a little, in my view, a little bit odd because it was a definition that also put restrictions on, on a chokehold. In other words, it was, here's the move. And also uh, it, it's, it's 
prohibited be, if it leads to death or serious bodily injury. And it just didn't make that much sense there. So, so the chokehold definition just talks about the move. And by having this language in here, <clears throat> it makes it very clear that chokeholds are not to be used in a situation where a law enforcement officer wants to restrain an individual, where a law enforcement officer wants to use the, a chokehold to help uh, effectuate an arrest. None of those things are, are allowed. It's very clear that those things are not allowed. But what this does is it addresses, I think, the, the very legitimate concern that we heard from various law enforcement officers that what about the situation where, where the law enforcement officer is grappling with an individual where the, the fairly strict uh, definition of when lethal or deadly force can be used does apply, that there's an imminent risk of serious bodily injury or death, uh, and there's no other option, you know, that why should that law enforcement officer not use what would make a lot of sense as opposed, particularly if, if you say, well, instead use your firearm. You know, so, so this makes it very clear in a very restricted manner uh, that a chokehold in, in very limited circumstances can be used. And also there's some protection in the use of deadly force standards, uh, particularly uh, in C3, where they must cease the use of deadly force once that subject is under the officer's control or it doesn't, uh, you know, pre, uh, doesn't pose the imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. So this was really, you know, this is something just, I think, clarifies what we actually kind of were doing, but not in a very clear uh, way uh, with S-119 in conjunction with the prohibited restraint uh, offense. Uh, the situation without this amendment is that, yes, a law enforcement officer in that situation that I just described could use a chokehold and then would look to the justifiable homicide defense uh, uh, under the new offense that we have uh, for prohibited restraint. The, so they, they would have that ability, but it's just not as clear. This clarifies that you know, we recognize that there are limited circumstances where a chokehold uh, may be an appropriate uh, action for law enforcement officer to take. So I, I just, I think this just clarifies what, what we're trying to, to do uh, relative to what we passed last fall. So thanks. Thank you. Bryn. Okay, so the next change you see right below it is just that we've replaced prohibited restraint with chokehold, which we're going to do several other places in the bill. So moving on to section two, um, this is the, the prohibition on law enforcement use of chokeholds in Title 13. Um, replacing prohibited restraint with chokeholds, replacing the definition. Um, this is exactly as it appears in the standards section. Um, so that's the change that's made on section six. Um, I'm sorry, on page six, subdivision two. Um, and then also just replacing replacing the language throughout that, that uh, crime. Section three, um, this is the, this is new. Um, I think the remaining sections of the bill are new. Um, this is the provision that the Criminal Justice Council shall not offer um, or approve of any training on the use of prohibited restraints, um, except to identify and prevent their use. So the changes here just per, just swap out prohibited restraint for chokehold. And then the following section, section four, is the definitions um, section of law, which applies to um, the council. And on page seven, we've repl replaced prohibited restraint with chokehold. And on page eight is where we replace the definition. <clears throat> Section five, um, this is the language in Title 20 that passed as a part of S219 last year um, regarding um, administrative penalties that the council can impose for the use of excessive force or the use of a prohibited restraint. And again, the changes here are just to swap out prohibited restraint for chokehold. 
And then that is the remainder of the bill on page nine is as it appeared um, in the as introduced version. So no other changes there. Thank you. Uh, Will has a question. Thank you. So now going back to page five, um, section subsection six. So a law enforcement officer shall not use a chokehold on a person unless lethal force is justified pursuant to subdivision one of the subsection. So, you know, in short, if the officer believed uh, their life was in danger or uh, the life of, of someone else, that, that it would still be possible to use a chokehold. Is that correct? It is correct, um, as long as, as it's found to be objectively reasonable and necessary. Yes. But then a uh, uh, section later, uh, then on page six, it says under uh, uh, subsection, so F, uh, the, the council shall not approve, offer or approve any training on the use of a chokehold is defined in section uh, 2401 of this chapter, except for training designated to identify and prevent the use of chokeholds. So is the bills currently written, are we saying in a life or death situation a law enforcement officer could employ a chokehold, but in their actual training, they're not going to be uh, taught how to, to use one? Um, yes. Okay, thank you. That seems a little odd to me. It's like, if, if we're going to allow them to, if we're going to allow them to employ chokeholds in life or death situations, I, you know, I, I'm not certain I'm comfortable with the idea that uh, they're not going to be trained on how to employ one. Uh, if they are in a life or death situation where it needs to be used, you know, one, I, I certainly want a law enforcement officer to be able to, to defend themselves and save their life if necessary. But also I would think that if it is allowed under some circumstances, I would want a law enforcement officer to be properly trained on how to use one because they might uh, do less damage with training than if they were sort of improvising on the fly. So I, I feel like there's a bit of a disconnect between, between page five and page six here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Brynn. I'm not sure if you're able to address that, but certainly again, we will have um, members from the law enforcement community uh, testifying to, to address questions like that. Yeah, I mean, I think that you, Representative Nod has identified a, a, one of the major points of um, that the committee, both in the House and in the Senate, um, we're dealing with during S-119. Okay, any other questions for Bryn in terms of the proposed language? In the committee, okay, I'm not seeing any, any hands up. So let's... Uh, Let's take a 15 minute break and uh, then we will start with uh, disability rights.